Can you all stand as we read the portion of scripture in front of us? James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Ye a man may say, Thou hast faith, and have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and was imputed unto him for righteousness, and was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith alone. Likewise also was not Rahab the Halot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. May we all be seated. Pray for God to be merciful to us as we rightfully interpret the passage. We continue in our study in the book of James. And as we said, this is probably one of the most difficult portions in the whole of scriptures. Not that there are other difficult passages in the Bible, but the interpretation of those passages does not attack usually the core of Christianity. But this passage is difficult because as I said in the last two Sundays, and I repeat that almost every time, that the difference between salvation and eternal damnation will depend on how you understand faith and works in this passage. Now there are, I, I explain why this passage is very difficult to explain. First and foremost, in the original Greek, there are no punctuation marks. So you really have no indication where to stop, where to pause. Is, is, is there something where you can understand by the punctuations? So it's not there. Second, the Greek and the alphabet, the words that are used in Greek here are standard which are used through the New Testament. So the, the, the verses itself, the Greek itself does not make it very easy for us to understand. Like we spoke last time that the word for justification, the word for salvation, the word for faith is the same word that's used in the rest of the Bible. So when we have Paul telling us that salvation is by faith alone, justification is by faith alone, those are the very terms what James is going to use here. And we do not land up coming into the confusion that justification is by faith as well as works. That's heresy. And we spoke time and again that justification is by faith alone, but we kept saying that this faith is seen. This faith is visible to people. Now, since this text is so difficult to interpret, you would find people discussing this subject in various ways. Now, many of them get the overall aspect of this verse, of this chapter right. Because we are on the Protestant side, we understand that God would not justify a man on the basis of his works. It can never be possible because not a single work of man is free from sin. Everything that man does is always sinful. We also explained last uh, a couple of Sundays before that what faith means, what's the definition of faith. And I, I, I would want you to remember this because as we continue through this passage today, we need to understand what faith is defined. And we define faith as an assent, saying yes to a statement. When you understand a statement, you believe that statement is true, you say yes to the statement, and your behavior will go according to that statement. And we give an example of the chair, and, and I want you to remember this as we go on. Last time we made a mention of a faith which is hollow. 
we said here's a faith which is dead now it's important to understand what do you mean by a faith which is dead a faith which is hollow it does not mean that a person who has faith who had true faith his faith can become hollow or his faith can become dead it can never happen that a person who believes in the gospel who truly loves the lord who has his sins forgiven has his name written in the book of eternal life for whom christ has died on the cross can become an enemy of the gospel that can never happen salvation is bought by the lord faith is given by the lord and is kept by him so if someone has a hollow faith we mean that that faith is not real that faith is hypocritical it's a dead faith now i want you to remember the faith is not dead as much as that man who claims as faith is dead so when a person says he has faith but the faith is not true the person is still a man dead in his sins similarly when we say that a faith is living the idea is the faith is living is so much true that the person that we disc discussing about that person is alive in god and so the faith he professes because he is alive his faith is alive the moment you mix this thing these things up you'll understand you'll land up thinking that there is there are different kinds of faith people can believe the same thing but one can be a living faith and one can be a dead faith that cannot happen faith is when you believe something to be true and you act upon it and we remember we said this that faith is given by god turn with me to 1 corinthians chapter 12 1 corinthians chapter 12 which is was seven onwards but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another the gift of healing by the same spirit you read here that faith is given by god now let no one tell you that okay faith might be given by god but even the faith to go on or the increase in faith is something that we do so what god saves you is through the strength of your conviction we'll speak more about that but even that is not true turn to romans 12 verse 3 romans 12 verse 3 for i say to the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly accordingly as god had dealt to every man the measure of faith god has dealt to every man the measure of faith god gives the depth of faith if we will want to use the word so last time we spoke about is a faith that is dead meaning a person who is not alive whose faith is not alive and it demonstrates his dead faith how does it demonstrate his dead faith that the true love for the brethren does not come out james chapter 2 verse 15 and 15 to 17 if a brother be naked or destitute of daily food as well, and one of you say unto them depart in peace be ye warmed and filled notwithstanding ye given them not those things which are needful to the body what does it profit so if you had faith james says that that faith would be seen that faith would be demonstrated so till now james is telling us how dead faith a false faith a hypocritical faith is demonstrated now he is going to show how a living faith would be demonstrated now overall we discussed this passage and we have discussed that this passage essentially means that you are not saved by faith with works you are not saved because you add your works to your faith you are not saved because your faith increases gradually no you faith you saved by faith by belief and anyone who is saved by belief will show good works that's the overall understanding of this passage but the reason i'm going through extreme care in this particular passage and taking so much time is many times things in this passage are taken and wrestled out of context and it is taught 
to mean something completely opposite of what the passage says. Many people would use this passage and say that it depends how deep is your faith. Now, depth here would mean sincerity or strength or, or, or a strong adherence to the truth. Some people will say, how deep is your conviction of your faith? Now, all this problem happens because faith itself is not defined. So they'll say the Pharisee had did not have depth in his faith, but a true Christian has depth in his faith. So what, if you think about it, what has saved a true Christian is not faith, is saved by the depth of his faith. Now that's not true. If, if someone reads through the uh, catechism notes I send every morning, if you just check a couple of days back, we did question number 61. Question number 61, I'll read that for you from the Heidelberg Catechism. It says something like this. Why sayest thou that thou art righteous by faith alone? And he says, not that I'm acceptable to God on account of the worthiness of my faith. Note that carefully. Not that I'm acceptable to God on account of the worthiness of my faith, but because only the satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ is my righteousness before God. And I cannot receive and apply the same to myself any other way than by faith only. So I do not become acceptable in front of God because my faith is worthy. So the difference between me and the reprobate Pharisee is not that my faith is much more worthy or much more accurate. If the Pharisee believes in something and it said the Pharisee held on to it loosely, that's not the point. But many people misinterpret this and misinterpret it badly. Like as against what we read about the from the Heidelberg Catechism, that it is not the worthiness of faith. Look at what Pastor John MacArthur mentioned in his commentary on the book of James. He says, a third characteristic of dead faith is shallow conviction a recognition of certain facts about God and his word without submission to either. I'll repeat what Pastor MacArthur says. He says, a third characteristic of dead faith is shallow conviction, a recognition of certain facts about God and his word without submission to either. As we go later into the passage, Pastor MacArthur wants to show that demons are also very orthodox in their belief, but the orthodoxy is dead and they believe not without conviction, and they do not submit to what they believe. He says something like this. So what he wants us to tell you is, salvation is based on the depth of your faith, or how strongly you are there to faith. Now here's a basic problem to begin with of MacArthur's statement. First problem is, the word he used, conviction. If you pick up a dictionary, for example, if you read the Webster's Dictionary, which I have in front of me, says conviction is a strong persuasion or belief. Meaning conviction has the same meaning as belief or having faith. So when someone says death faith is a faith with shallow faith, is that still faith? Is that something truth in it with the person holds on to makes absolutely no sense. Either the faith is false, either he does not believe in it, or there is some element of truth in what he believes, and he believes it wholeheartedly. Faith, conviction, belief are all interchangeably used. So when he says a third characteristic of dead faith is shallow conviction, then he makes something, says something very drastic. A recognition of certain facts about God and his word without submission to either. So he says, that they recognize certain facts about God being true. But they do not submit to it. Now here's the problem. MacArthur does not define faith. If certain facts are true, and if someone believes in them, and if he still does not submit to them, that means he does not believe in them at the first place. Please recollect the example of the chair that I'd given. If someone believes that the chair will hold his weight, he says he has faith, but then he says, I will not sit on it. His disagreement to sit on the chair shows that even though he says that he believes that the chair will hold his weight, his actions deny that. 
So if I use MacArthur's term, it'll be like, he does not submit to the truth he believes. That really shows he does not believe to begin with. So when someone believes in the truth, he says the truth is there, he believes in the truth. And if it does not walk according to it, then it shows that his faith is hypocritical. We know this about the Pharisees. MacArthur time and again quotes the Pharisees believed, but the point is Pharisees never believed. Look at what he says ahead when it comes to the part of the faith of the demons. He says, well, James starts with a touch of sarcasm and I'm quoting MacArthur here. This cast against an imaginary but universally common orthodoxy that is devoid of saving faith. Now pay attention here. Orthodox doctrine is no guarantee of salvation, James insists. I'll, I'll repeat what MacArthur says. He says, Orthodox doctrine is no guarantee of salvation, James insists. But this is shocking. I mean, even if someone, I'm very sure, quotes this back to MacArthur, that this is what you make of the statement. MacArthur will say the statement is completely wrong because it's an unqualified doc statement. If orthodox doctrine does not guarantee salvation, then what is the whole point of teaching ministry? Why should we actually try to teach people? Now, statement is so broad that someone would say, no, no, doesn't it? Is it not right? When you compare the Pharisees, they had the orthodox doctrine. But did the Pharisees really believe in the orthodox doctrine? Did they believe what the scriptures taught? If so, would the Lord really charge them with hypocrisy? Lord constantly tells them that you say you believe in the scriptures, the scriptures testify about me, but you do not believe. What did they not believe? Not the Lord and not the scriptures. He time and again shows them that you do not believe Abraham, you do not believe Moses. Everyone thinks that you are orthodox, but you are apostates from the true religion. So when MacArthur says orthodox doctrine is no guarantee of salvation, so we need to ask, what is the guarantee of salvation? When the Lord says, unless you believe that I am he, or when he, when he spoke of, that the Bible gives you eternal life, what do you get, go, where do you go to get salvation? When, when Peter told the Lord that you have the words of eternal life. But the Pharisees never believed Moses, never believed the law. But they kept identifying themselves and calling themselves as the children of Abraham. But they were not. The Lord himself called them as bastards and children of the devil. So what MacArthur could have made it much more easier or much more complete by saying orthodox doctrine alone is not a guarantee of salvation because the only way up I can judge a person's salvation is by the profession of faith to begin with. If the word of God is not the guarantee and it works and good works physically done in the world is a guarantee, then let's consider the cults, the Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, or even the desperate, the wicked group like, like the children of God. They have extreme love for each other. But will we consider them as orthodox? Will we consider them as believers or fellow children of God? No, they, they're not. So when we make a very broad statement that orthodox doctrine is not a guarantee of salvation, it almost means, and MacArthur does this too often in his books, where he says that the devils actually believed and that belief did not give them salvation. We'll speak more about that when we come to that passage or that portion. So let's look at the passage. So what's happening? James is continuing. So now he has shown till now, till verse 14, that from verse 14, that there is a dead faith which shows itself in a particular kind of work, but there's a faith which is alive. And he's continuing with the same kind of diatribe, a literary genre in which there is an objector and there's a person who's defending his position. And he's telling, and it's not like there are two different people. One has faith and one has works. 
Look at that. We read from verse 16. Oh, sorry, verse 18. Yeah, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without the works. I'll show thee my faith by my works. So it might actually look as if there are two people here. One has faith and the other has works. But we just read two passages of scripture. We read Romans chapter 12, verse 3. We read Corinthians chapter 12, in which both we saw that faith is given by God. Even the depth of your faith is given by God. So any person who says he has faith, it's a faith that God gives. Any person who says he has works, it's the ability to do the work is given by God. So these are not two different people who will have to work hard to come to the other person's position. It's almost like the same person saying, I need to have works that shows my faith. Or if I have true faith, it shows my work. My true works in loving my brethren, helping them when it's needed, giving the truth, loving the gospel, praying for wisdom, having a tongue that is controlled, all of that shows out the true religion which is there. So when I want to help the people in the church, when I do not do injustice to people, when I work against the injustice done to people, when I want to help the poor, the needy, the alien, the, the widow, the fatherless, I show my true religion. So it's not like two different people are speaking here. It's one person who's speaking and telling the other person, kid, do you have faith? Where are your works? If you say you have faith and you're not going to show works, then that's not true faith. So now we look at the examples of living faith. Now, anyone who's read the passage and you have read the passage, and if I ask you, can you tell me how many examples of living faith are given here? It's very easy to understand. You would say, okay, you have Abraham's example, you have Rahab's example. And I, and I will be surprising you with one more example that you'll understand what are the true examples of a living faith. And let's let's look at the portion in front of us, verse 17 onwards. So even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Your man may say, there is faith, I have works. Show me the faith without the works and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And we'll spend a good amount of time in explaining this verse. Why are we spending a good amount of time in this verse? Because a lot of times people would explain this word to show to you that it is not the faith that saves. And the example given to you is you can have faith, even demons have faith, but demons do not get salvation. Even MacArthur says the same thing. James is trying to make an example, a mockery, by using the example of the demon and saying demons believe, but demons do not get saved because their faith is not true. Now I want you to first look at what James is explaining. Remember, James is speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience. What does he tell them? You believe the Lord is one. Can you turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4? Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. This is one of the most important verses for the life of an Orthodox Jew. They usually refer to it as the Shama. The verse is here, here is the word Shama. Here, Israel, Lord your God is one. Or if, if it's in Hebrew, it will be Shama Yisrael, Yahweh Elihanu, Yahweh Ihad. Which basically is a statement that every Jew would reside in the years of the newborn. This was a statement, if you read the rest of the passage, you learn that the Lord said, you have to write this down on your doorposts. You have to write, put this on the top of your foreheads. You have to teach this word to your children. This doctrine that God is one was so fundamentally important to the Jews that they would have to write it everywhere, constantly teach their children. A good Jew would have seen this verse and seen his life in that verse. This verse is not simply 
to show a belief in monotheism. You need to understand that. There are many religions in the world which is monotheistic. Right? You have Islam, you have even in some forms of Sikhism, you can consider it to be monotheistic. You have so many new religions that are considering about monotheism. It's not only the old Judaistic religion was monotheistic. So here, it's not a simple statement of monotheism. It's a statement about God's character. And they were told that you have to write this thing down. Now, look at the beauty of this verse that James quotes. He's not trying to insult a devout Jew by saying there's a common denominator between you and the demon. The demon also believes in this belief that God is one. I want you to look at the text very carefully. When, when James is speaking about the devil, is he actually critiquing the demon's belief? Is he saying the demons believe wrongly? No, he says demons believe God is one. Good, it is true. You also believe God is one. Demons also believe God is one. So the belief of the demons is not false. It's true belief. So when someone says demons believe that God is one, but that does not save them, the problem is salvation is not meant for the angelic realm. Demons were never supposed to be saved, neither angels. We, we read from the Bible that angels desire to look into the idea of mercy of God, the salvation that God has on humans, and they cannot understand that. So when someone says devils believe in the Lord is one, but that does not save them, completely misses the point of the text. The belief that demons have is not meant for salvation. And the belief that James is saying is not critiquing the demons at all. He's not saying that the faith of the demons is false. Rather, he's saying the faith of the demons is true. I asked you when I started this, how many examples do you have in this passage of faith working out? We all said, Oh, we all understood Abraham, obviously. Rehab, obviously. But look at how James starts. James starts with the demons. He says the demons believe that God is one. In the Old Testament, whenever God came in front of the people, the people shuddered. When they saw God, they shuddered. Demons understand God is one, understand the power of God, and because they believe in this, their action is seen. What is the action of the demons? They shudder in front of God. You know what James is trying to tell these Jews who consider themselves to be very good people? He tells them, you believe God is one? Even demons believe that. But why are you not shuddering? The demons are showing, they're working out their faith that God is one and they're shuddering because God is going to judge them. Why are you not believing that God is going to judge them and judge you and why are you not shuddering in front of God who's going to judge you? When you have a verbal profession which is not followed by actions, James is saying even demons have actions according to their verbal profession. They believe God is one. They believe there is one God and one judge and they'll be judged on one day. And they fear that day, day and they shudder. Where are your actions? This verse in no way shows that you can have faith which is lesser. I've seen this verse used so many times in, in such bad examples. And, and that's the reason I wanted this thing to be, be understanding that there, you might have heard people say that it's a different thing believing about Jesus and it's a different thing believing in Jesus. Like, for example, they say, you know about Jesus, but do you know Jesus? Now, all these have no meaning. If someone believes in things about Jesus, 
he believes in Jesus. We, we, we studied that with the psalm that anyone who believes in the Lord will keep his commandments. So if someone believes that Jesus was born of a virgin, the point is not that he explains everything in that matter scientifically. No, he knows what, he, it's not that he exactly knows the details of what's happening. But as long as he's a man with some kind of sanity in this world, he knows that virgins cannot give birth. And here was someone who was born of a virgin and he believes it to be true. And he believes this person was untouched by sin because he was born of a virgin. If you know something of God, your life is going to change. If you know something of God and you believe something about God and you believe it to be true, your life is going to gonna change. Faith has to be accompanied by action. Faith without action shows that there is no action. So the person is really not alive. His faith is dead and so is he. When someone believes in something, that belief will be seen. The belief will be seen in what he does. So demons have faith. And demons have actions according to that faith. That verse never says that demons' faith is useless to them. No, the faith of demons is useful for them. They shudder when they understand what their faith implies. They understand that there is only one judge who's going to judge them at the end. Let's look ahead in this passage. We will not go through all of that. We'll just look at one more small thing. And then we'll close for today. Yeah, a man may say, thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith with, by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now that word used there, vain man, is a, is a word which is very important in this passage. That word vain means empty. Some, some translations use the word foolish, but the word empty is a better word. So he's saying, O man, you're empty. If you're empty, there is no faith inside you. So even on the outside, hypocritically, people might look at faith, but what is required on the inside, it's empty, there is no faith. You are vacuous. And that's a question that each of us who are a part of a church, part of years of being taught, do we ask that question that does our faith show out to people in works? As we said last time, Anything that we believe in, anything that we believe in, will be shown out. There cannot be a single doctrine that cannot move you. There cannot be a single doctrine that cannot help you in your daily life. If that's the case, what's happening is you're reading the doctrine, but you're never able to get the implication of the doctrine outside. I want you to understand this, how beautifully we have to learn doctrine and find out the meaning of that and struggle to understand what it implies to me. Otherwise, there'll be no joy in re reading scriptures. We were, we were discussing in the morning about work. We discussed how difficult work is. But is it something that the Bible tells us? That you will eat when it was given to Adam? That when he plows, he'll get what? He'll get thorns and thistles through which he will get fruit. But that's the promise that he'll still get thorns and thistles when he works. That does not mean he cannot work. He should not till the land. He should. But even when he tills, he will get thorns and thistles. So rather than being worried about how we are going through work, we need to understand this is a promise that God has made. Though I might get thorns and thistles, and this is because of sin, Adam's sin, and I'm in Adam. And all that I'm facing today at work is partly because of my sin. But my labor is not fruitless. 
every doctrine that you study, you'll have to understand how to get out the, the, the implication, the application for your life, where you are. The meaning of the text does not change. But the application of that can be varied to where you are. No greater comfort is there for a person than to understand what every doctrine of scriptures would mean to you. There are so many times when I speak to people who call themselves as Calvinists. And the whole meaning of Calvinism is, is taken down to pure fatalism. The reason I say this is there are so many times people say that whatever has been decided will happen. So I really don't have to worry about things. No, that's fatalism. That's not biblical idea of God's providence. Everything goes to a marked end by God's plan. It is not random chance. What happens in the world, or, or lady luck as someone might call it, it's not by random chance that people work. That's irrational because no one knows what is the final end. But in Christianity, I know that the Lord is going to lead all things finally to what? To his son. He has made me for what purpose? To worship his son. He's kept me where? On his right hand. Now. So in this world, when I learn about my ideas of Calvinism and what I study through, I understand that there are second causes required. I have to do my part in all that God calls me. This is not some random chance. This is not a rational idea. There is an end meant to be. In luck, there is no end. There is no purpose of what's happening in the world. Same thing is scientific mechanism in the world. Why things happen in the world, no one knows. What is the end? No one knows. That's not Christianity for you. When you go through your life and you go through the most difficult parts of your life, through sin, through sickness, through death, through rejection. You need to understand, God has an end in mind, which is meant for your good and my good. Does that faith in that God who controls everything, who's written the end from the beginning in which you play a part? What use is your idea of Calvinism when you think I'm not really needed in this? Your faith would change the way you live your life. It changes the way the devils live their lives. They shudder. How can our faith not be seen outside? James is asking the devout Jew, where is your trembling when you know you constantly teach your children that your God is one? What use is writing it on the doorposts and murmuring in the ears of your children when the fear of the Lord is not there in you? What use is screaming the Shema from the rooftop when you do not believe what the Shema actually says? Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, your Lord, O God, is one. That statement, that true statement is believed by the devils also, and their life shows it out. Oh, what a shame. If your lives don't show that, if our lives don't show that. Is your faith alive? Do you believe in the truth? The first example that Abraham gives us of a faith that shows evidence is the devil's faith that produces the desired results in the devil. Do you have faith? Does your faith produce the desired results for which God has made you to give his name glory, to show his glory to the world. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Abba Father, we come to your throne again.
to that one God, the thrice holy God, the God who knows the end from the beginning, never changing, and has kept all judgment to his son. We come to that God, O Master, and we ask that give us understanding, O God, to check our lives where it matters. You give us faith. You increase our faith. Help us, Lord, that the evidence of faith would be seen in us, through us. Let the works of our hands be acceptable to you, O God. Give us, Lord, the opportunities in the midst of trouble, in the midst of difficulties, to stand as a Christian. To stand in the, in the worst possible things that happen in the world and not to tremble at that. But to tremble at the name of Yehovah. Our God, the only true God who made the heaven and the earth. That one God, and help us, Lord, to understand that he is one and he is going to judge. Let me tremble at that thought. But also, Master, let me know that judge and whom he has given, ascribed all future judgment to your son, my cover, my rock, my advocate, my help. whose righteousness covers my sinful actions, my sinful desire, my person, that on the judgment day when I stand in front of you, the only thing that I can ask for, beg for, is not mercy because of who we are, but mercy because of who covers us, your son. Our brother, our friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, we offer this prayer.